is a God of order. He is a God of guidance and direction. When we study the Holy Spirit, there is much that has been said. There's much in what is written in the Word of God about the Holy Spirit that I think for the most part escapes the average Christian. There are, I reading yesterday, uh, a commentary that I didn't really know anything about the person who was writing. I knew he was well known and uh, obviously well thought of. And I got about halfway into his commentary and realized that he was one of those who tried to tell us that the workings of the Holy Spirit are not for today or, or in the essence of the gifts and, and that type of thing. So I immediately qu quit reading that because I didn't believe what he was saying. He just was not on target. Go to the Bible, go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and you can also thumb over to Galatians chapter 5. Make a little marker there, if you, if you will, because we'll be going there next. I'm going to hit several verses of Scripture this morning if I get all the way through this. I don't know how far I'll get into this this morning. But one of the things that I noticed the other night, and I'm not being critical because I was really thrilled that we had the young people especially come forward and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But too often we are a little timid about such things. You need to understand that there's no timidity in the Holy Spirit. Right. None whatsoever. Amen. There's a boldness that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a boldness that comes with functioning and operating under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that boldness will always be in line with and in order with what God is doing. Nothing, the Holy Spirit is never going to interrupt the Holy Spirit. I heard, or I have not seen this, but I heard of a minister preaching a sermon and someone standing up in the middle of the message and just blurting out a message in tongues in the middle of his message without any leading or guiding of the Holy Spirit whatsoever they thought that was the time to do it well what that is is the Holy Spirit does not interrupt the Holy Spirit right. if a man is preaching from the pulpit hopefully <laughs> at any rate he's guided by uh, instructed by led by the Holy Spirit to deliver that message so the Holy Spirit will never disrupt, will never bring attention to the person. I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, how do I know the difference when someone is acting in the flesh and when someone is acting under the power of the Holy Spirit? He says, when the focus goes off of the Holy Spirit onto the person, that's flesh. That doesn't mean that a person can't do something uh, or, or anything, but the focus of the Holy Spirit's movement, the focus of what the Holy Spirit tells us to do is always, always brings glory to God. The Holy Spirit does one, has one job, and that's to point to Jesus. Everything he does points to Jesus. It's never about pointing to the person. And so that's why through the years that I have preached about some of the behaviors that I have seen in Pentecostal churches. I've never called them wrong, but I have brought into question whether or not those people were acting under the influence of the Holy Spirit or putting on a show. Basically putting on a, a, an act, if you will. That's not what the book of Acts is all about, okay? And so, uh, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 1 and uh, take a look at one verse of scripture there. We know that Jesus left and he told the disciples, he says, go and wait for the promise of the Father. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry there until the Comforter comes. In verse 8, 
Jesus himself says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now there's three things that Jesus brings out here about the Holy Spirit that we want to focus on today. First of all, he says you will see, receive power. Holy Ghost power is the most powerful force on the planet. More powerful than nuclear weapons. It's more powerful than anything because it has God that is behind that power. It is a Holy Spirit's power. He says, that, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. The second thing we want to point out today is his presence. The Holy Spirit brings his presence. And if we are yielded to that presence, then we're never going to be outside of the will of God. Amen. So there's power and there's presence. He says, He will come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in, in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The third thing is His purpose. Amen. We get the power, we get His presence, and we find out what His purpose is. Because it is through the power of the Holy Ghost. It is through the operation and functioning of the Holy Ghost that we find out the purpose for us being here, for God, what God wants to get done, what it is that God wants to do. So it takes an obedient person. The first thing a person has to do is be saved. First person, the thing a person has to do is they have to yield themselves to God in the first place. They have to yield themselves and realize their need for a Savior. Now that makes that person immediately eligible for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Go to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now that word walk there means to deport oneself, or in plainer language, how you live. It has to do with how you live. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, it dictates to you, it guides you, it directs you, it leads you, it, it shows you how to live your life for God on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment, situation-by-situation leading and guiding. It's not a, a general instruction, one shoe fits all. It, that's not it. It's a day-to-day -day experience. Now, if you'll notice after that chapter, it says, verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. There's always that battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. And the spirit is against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, your spirit will change what you do. It will change how you live your life. It is the Holy Spirit that brings about the change in us when we get saved and when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, they're apparent. Which are these? Such things as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now he gives a list there. That's not an all-inclusive list. But you take those words and break them down word for word. You'll see where a good bit of sin is covered in those things. He's telling you that those things are the things that are of the flesh. But verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The, the fruit of the Spirit is that that the Spirit of God will begin to create in a believer, begin to create in a person who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That fruit of the Spirit is a result of you getting saved. That is a result of you giving your heart to Christ. That is a result of you yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit. You're, that fruit will be a natural result of what God is doing in your heart and life. Think about that for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes you 
turn from the person you were. You may have been a pretty good person before. But whatever was going on in your heart before, that Holy Spirit dwelling in you, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to produce fruit. To produce that that is consistent with the Word of God. But now we look down here in verse uh, 25 and it says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now you have walk in verse 25. You have walk in verse 16. The meaning for walk in 16 is how you live or how you deport oneself. In other words, it's your lifestyle. But the word walk in the 25th verse has a little bit different meaning to it. It means to march in rank. Amen. And you go, well, what does that got to do with Christianity, brother? It means you walk with those who are living as you're living. In other words, there's, a, there's uniformity in what you do. There's, there's a, 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 it's a military type walk that you do. You do it in step. You're not one that's going to step outside of what everything else does. You're not going to disrupt what God is doing in the community because you're in rank with, you're in, you're in step with everybody else that's on the same page as you are. Amen. And so you're going to walk in that. You're going to walk not only how you live your life, but how you conform to what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. That march will take you to virtue and to piety. It will take you to that place. It will keep you in line, if you will. It will keep you in line with what God is doing in the body of Christ. So you have these two different kinds of walk here that are a result of the Holy Spirit. They're a result of being saved. They're a result of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and I've said this many, many times before, it aids us in our walk with Him. Now, we get saved. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We have that power within us. But when we get baptized in the Holy Ghost, there's a sudden closeness, a sudden understanding more of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Now, I want to stop right there for a moment. And I want to back up to last week's service when these young people came down and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I told each one of them, I gave them instructions. I said, I'm going to lay hands on you. And when I lay hands on you, I want you to speak by faith what the Lord gives you. Because the speaking in tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That shows you. The evidence is not for me. What that does is it shows the believer they've just received. It's the only one of the nine gifts that is essential to show evidence of the Holy Ghost. Not to say that the others don't show evidence, but it is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we have people in this church who've been here maybe for some time, and for whatever reasons they've never came forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's their business. I don't try to pressure anybody to believe like I do. I preach it like I see it and like I believe it and like this word says it and it's up to them to receive what God wants. We got people I think that are afraid of the Holy Spirit. They're afraid of that notion. Maybe they've been taught through the years that it's wrong. There are people out there that teach that it's of the devil. Well nothing of the devil is going to make you love people more. Nothing of the devil is going to make you love Jesus more. And that's what happens when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. What you're doing, the word bab baptized, it comes from the Greek word baptismo, which means to immerse in. What you are doing is you're immersing yourself in the Holy Spirit. The, the, the meaning of that really means holy wet. In other words, entirely wet. When we baptize in that baptismal up there, we're going under the water. You're going to go all the way under and back up. There's going to be a total, holy, wet experience in that baptism. We don't sprinkle. We don't throw a little water on somebody and say that's baptism. Because that's not what the word means. So when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're doing essentially the same thing. And I'm going to get on the living water here as I go on with these messages. We'll get to that living water later on. But you're wholly wet. You're wholly immersed. So when these young people came forward the other day, they were baptized. They were immersed in the Holy Spirit. The first thing I told them was, I said, you have to yield your tongue. 
You have to yield your tongue to the Spirit. That doesn't mean that the Spirit's going to come and speak for you. Because you don't receive anything from the Lord that you not received by faith. How did you know you were saved? You knew you were saved because you believed in who Jesus was and what he did on that cross. And as a result of believing what he did on that cross, you received your salvation and you knew in your spirit, you knew down deep inside of you, you were saved. You knew that not because you saw something, not because uh, something took place, but you knew that by faith. And you yielded yourself to come forward. So when you get ready to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're already saved. That's a done deal. You, you're on your way to heaven. But to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, you have to first have that initial evidence of speaking in another language. And that comes through the speaking in tongues. Amen. Speaking in tongues, what do you do? You yield, just like you yielded your heart, for salvation, you yield that tongue to the power of the Holy Spirit and you speak by faith just like you did when you got saved. You stepped out in faith and believed. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you yield your tongue to the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean He takes over. It means that you're speaking in faith. You're speaking by faith in who He is and what God has promised you. And you begin to speak it. And as you, be, as you step out and yield that tongue, he begins to fill it. He begins to give you that. Now, all, I'm not being critical here, but I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. That for those of you who were baptized the other day, you were a little timid. You're a little bit timid about speaking out. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. doesn't mean you didn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit. But you have to understand that the Holy Ghost is all about boldness. It's all about filling you up with the power of God. It's all about filling you up with the presence of God. It's all about you going into the purpose of God for your life. And so I recommend to each and every one of you that you get rid of that timidity. You ask God for some boldness. And the next time you go to your prayer closet and you begin to pray in tongues, you speak it out so the whole world can hear you. It's not about necessarily the volume. It's about your desire to speak in that other language. It's about your desire to connect with God. Because when you're praying, and I'll get into this some more as we study this more, as you're praying in tongues, you're praying the perfect prayer to God. Yes, amen. The perfect prayer to God. Now, I can show you that in Romans 8. I've, I've, I've preached on that before. I'm not going to go there today because I don't have time. But I want you to remember that yielding. Yielding means to literally turn yourself over to you're turning yourself over to the power of the Holy Ghost as he is feeling. And there's three things, three points I want to make today. Uh, we're talking about the power and the presence and the purpose. But my three points is this. You've got to learn to yield yourself. You've got to learn to yield your understanding. And you've got to learn to yield your service to God. That's what happens when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's a lot more going on than that. But those are the three main topics that we're going to talk about today. These are the things that you need to learn to yield to. The, a totally yielded vessel is the only thing that the Holy Spirit will bless. If you're playing games with God, and I don't think anybody was. I'm not saying that, but I'm making a point. If you're just playing at being filled with the Holy Ghost, that's dangerous territory. You don't want to go there. God is looking for a totally yielded vessel. When you come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, your actions stated, hey, I want everything God's got for me. I want every possible thing that God has got for me. I want that. I'm here for that. Brother Mullen, I'm coming down. And you're going to lay hands on me. You said you were going to show me how to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. You can't do it because Jesus is a baptizer. Understand this. All five of the candidates that came down the other day and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they received it from Jesus. Jesus is the one that baptizes. We have a, 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 one of our banners back there says Jesus the baptizer. Amen. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. But when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen? Amen? And so, you're yielded to that. Don't be timid. Speak it out. Amen. That yielded vessel is what he's looking for. Now, I want you to get this. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say because it's very, very important. This yielded vessel... 
Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me back up a little bit. I don't want to confuse you this morning. I really want you to get this this morning. I'm really, it's really sad that other people aren't here. There's a lot of people need to hear this that are not here today. Go to Romans chapter 6. Again, it's about yielding to the Holy Spirit. You're yielding yourself. You're, you're, you're telling the Holy Spirit, hey, I want it all. Give me, your, give me your power. Give me your presence. Show me your purpose. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm down here, and that's why I'm receiving here. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Neither yield ye your members. Members is talking about your bodily functions. Everything from how, what you do to uh, your, your mind, your body, your soul, or your body parts, your heart, your, your, your desires. All of that is included in members. It says yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. Amen. Neither, excuse me, let me back up and read that properly. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. In other words, don't take this, this blessing that you've received in the Holy Spirit and now take it and use it for something that's not right. You don't get the gifts to use for your own personal purposes. And so you take this power and you don't yield your, your instruments as unrighteousness, but the verse goes on to say, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, alive just like we walk in the Spirit, we are alive from the dead, and your members are instruments of righteousness unto God. In other words, now what you're doing as baptized believers, you're yielding yourself. Your hands, your feet, your legs, your nose, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, everything. When, when I lift, when I lift weights, when I exercise, I do it as unto the Lord. That's not something that you have to do. I just want to do that. Amen. I want everything I do to bless God. I want, you know, Lord, I'm lifting this for you. When I start getting tired and want to quit, I say, I can't quit on God. And so that's just one of the many things that you can do when you yield yourself that means when you go out on the day, when you, you get ready to get dressed and you get up and you go to school or you go to work or you go to your neighborhood or you go to whatever, you go out there, you're yielding yourself unto God. You don't take yourself and put yourself in an environment that is not of God. That is yielding yourself to unrighteousness. You have to make up your mind you're going to serve God and, and, and seek righteousness or you're going to continue to live your way the way you've always lived and yield yourself to unrighteousness. And that is not going to help you be stronger. That's going to lead you away from God. Everything that you come into contact with uh, uh, in unrighteousness is going to drag you down. It's going to tempt you. It's going to pull you away from the things of God. That's why you need to be in church. That's why you need to be in the Word. That's why you need to pray. That's why you need to surround yourself with other believers. That's why you need to watch what you do, what you say, where you go, and how you do it. We do that because we're, we are surrendering our members to righteousness. We're surrendering to the things that are of God. You can't expect to be with the old gang that, is, that are not saved and stay away from unrighteousness. Sooner or later, it's, even if you don't partake of it, sooner or later it's going to taint you. Sooner or later it's going to tempt you. Sooner or later you're going to be right back where you started from. And you've already been given this miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest power on the face of the planet has been given to you and then it was even enhanced in you because you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have all this power. You have all the, the availability of His presence. You have the, the availability and the understanding on how to be in His purpose and you're going to go out there and, and surrender yourself to unrighteousness? You're going to go out there, well, them are my friends. I want to hang around with my friends. I don't want to give up my friends. When you gave your heart to Christ, you gave the world up. If your friends are real friends, they'll see something in you and want some of it. If they're not your real friends, then what have you lost? You've lost somebody that would lead you to unrighteousness. That's what you've lost. 
You've lost someone who would drag you down in the pit to where they're at. That's what you came out of. You came out of that because you didn't want that in your life anymore. Amen? Yeah. It's okay for you young folks to amen me, you know. Amen. That means you're listening. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We don't, we're not under grace for the opportunity to abuse grace. That's not why we're under grace. We're under grace to help us stay in step. That's that military march. That's staying in line with the body of Christ. I don't mean you necessarily with them physically. But you think like the body of Christ. You act like the body of Christ. You do the things that the body of Christ does. You're walking in step with them. You're in rank. When you go into the military, the first thing they teach you to do is how to march. Well, the first thing they teach you how to do is lose all your hair. But that's neither here nor there. They'll shave your head down. But what they're... Well, let me go there for just a moment. Military is a good, a good example here. When you go into the military, the first thing they do is they tear you down from who you are. I don't care how good you are, how strong you are, how brave you are, how knowledgeable you are. They're going to take you and they're going to make you feel like you're just about the most worthless thing on the planet. But they do that for a reason. They bring you down and then they begin to build you back up. Those same DIs, and we call them TIs in Air Force, technical instructors. <laughs> That's a fancy word for a guy that'll ruin your day. But the technical instructors would tear you down, but as you are there a while, you begin to realize the tone changes a little bit. He's a little more encouraging than he was. He'll still chew your head off. But it's not quite as bad. And the longer you're there, well, by the time you leave boot camp, you're in step. Not only because you learn how to march, but because you learn how to be a soldier. You learn how to be what it was that they wanted you to be. The same principle works in Christianity. You've been, you've been drafted, if you will. I guess you could say, actually, believers are not drafted. They're, they're volunteers. So you have to agree to it. And we come into this rank, and we need to be in step with that. We need to be in righteousness, not unrighteousness. You know, when you're there about first time you lay your head down that night, you kind of miss mommy a little bit. You kind of miss being around your family and go, oh my goodness, I got four years of this. Can I put up with four years of this? And it only gets worse from there as they get tougher and tougher on you through the process. But you know what? You hang in there. You don't leave. You don't chicken out in the middle of the deal. Some people have actually done that, but I couldn't see myself doing that. There are those that don't make it because they can't take it. There are those who can't take it in the body of Christ because they can't make it. Because they don't understand the power they have available to them. They don't understand that the presence is always there. Do you understand right now that the presence of God is right there with you? He's never left you. You may have been totally foreign from where he was at. You may have been totally detached from the idea of the presence of God, but he's still there. He can't help otherwise. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. His, his presence everywhere is available to you at all times. All you have to do is reach out for his presence. All you have to do is ask to feel his presence. All you have to do is reach out to God. He's, his word says he will never leave you nor forsake you. It is us that we yield our members unto unrighteousness. God will back off. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Bible tells us that he can be grieved. And oftentimes when a sinner, I mean, when a believer steps into sin, that's exactly what happens. It doesn't mean he's abandoned you. It means you've abandoned him. Right. You're doing that that is not pleasing to him. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. He's telling us, no, we don't, we don't just use grace to sin. Right. Well, I'm under grace, so uh, it's okay if I do this. No, it's not. Sin is sin. It still separates you from the fellowship of God. First John chapter 1 
tells us very clearly about that. And I don't have time to go there, but you read 1 John chapter 1 where it talks about asking for forgiveness and Him cleansing us from our sins and from all unrighteousness. The verses before that, I believe it's verse 5 or 6, says that, that it talks about fellowship with God. That's what happens when we sin. It breaks fellowship with God. God's not going to sit next to you uh, while you sit and have a beer. God's not going to sit next to you while you sit there and lie. God's not going to sit next to you when you sit there and disrespect somebody or do whatever it is that you feel that you had to do and then you realize later on, hey, you know, I'm wrong. I was wrong in that. God's not going to stand, he, he will always stand by you, but he's not going to be there in the sense of you being able to feel his presence because you have separated yourself from the fellowship of God. All you have to do is confess your sin and he's faithful to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so we can go, we can, we can regain that as quickly as we lose it. But sin is not something that we have grace just so that we can commit sin. I said that totally backwards. We don't have grace so that we can just run around out here and sin. And a lot of people believe that. There's a lot of uh, uh, people that call themselves Christians and live any old way they want to. Oh, I'm on, it's under grace. Don't worry about it. Well, if you're under grace and you're sinning all the time, you've already broken fellowship with God. I don't know about you, but I like being connected to him. I like being able to feel that power. I like being able to feel that presence. I like being able to feel his purpose in all that I'm doing. I want to, I want to be in the center of God's will. I don't want to be out here in left field somewhere all by myself. I don't want to be there. I want to be as close to God as I can be. I want to hear. When, when, I, got, when I get ready to make a decision, I want God guiding me to make that decision. When I got ready to, to do something that's important, I want to know that what I'm doing is what God would have me to do and not what I want to do. Amen. Because you see, my tendency, your tendency is to lean towards the flesh. You're going you're gonna to lean towards the flesh. You have to have that power. You have to be able to feel that presence to stay in that purpose. And so you have to yield yourself first. That's the first thing that takes place when you get saved. The first thing that takes place when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a yielding that must take place. There's that place that you come to and you say, Okay, God, you know I lived my life for 44 years like I want to. If I wanted to do it, you've heard me say it. You heard my testimony. God, you, you know, I've had my way for a long time. It's time for you to have your way. And I yield myself. September the 23rd, you've heard it. September the 23rd, 1990, I gave it all to God. I yielded everything to Him. I didn't hold anything back. I didn't say, well, I want you, but I want to continue to end this sin like I tried to do once before. I didn't do that this time. It was an absolute, total yieldedness. When you see someone sword fighting, and the one guy pins him down, and he puts the sword to his chest, you heard him say, I yield. That means I surrender. That means I no longer want this conflict. I no longer want a sword fight with you because you just whipped me with it. I yield. That's what has to take place in a person that gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ. They have to totally and completely yield to what God wants to do in their heart and life. Amen. Totally and completely. It's got, it can't be a partial thing. Verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin... But ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. You're yielding yourself to righteousness. That's what takes place when you get saved. That's what takes place when you get baptized. It takes a, a deeper step, a more sincere step on your part. You're the vessel. Uh, and this vessel lives uh, within his power, within his purpose, knowing his, I mean, excuse me, in his presence, knowing his purpose. So it brings us to a point where we function in the Holy Spirit. We're, we live our life, going back to that walk in the Spirit. We live our life functioning in the Holy Spirit. 
Now here's the problem. A good bit of Christianity doesn't live in the Spirit. They don't walk in the Spirit. They're relying upon that grace. And I'm not saying they're not going to heaven because that's not my call. But they're out here walking in grace, but they're not walking in the Spirit. Too much of the church wants to walk only in grace and not walk in the Spirit. And that's the wrong place for a Christian to be. You're not going to be effective. You're not going to be able to accomplish the things that God would have you to accomplish. Listen to me, candidates. And I'm talking about the five that were baptized and anybody else that's in here and shot. You've got to walk in the Spirit. You've got to want the Spirit's guidance. You can come down here. You can come with a sincere heart. I believe every one of you came with a sincere heart. You came with a desire to have more of God. How many of you, and this, you don't have to raise your hands, you don't have to answer anybody this question, it's between you and God. How many of you walked away from here and have hardly given that another thought as to what that meant? I hope you understood that you were closer to God now than you were before. That doesn't mean you're more saved. You got saved, you're saved. That's it. But you are more receptive. You're in fellowship with God. You're in not only fellowship with God, but you're in close fellowship with God. You have been immersed in the Holy Spirit. That immersion in the Holy Spirit has brought you to a new place with God that you've never been before. A new understanding, a new receptiveness. You ever been in a, well, I probably hadn't. <laughs> in the old cars, if you were traveling on the highway, you would try to tune in a station. We have serious radio now. You hear it everywhere you go. I rented a car here a couple of years ago to go on vacation and forgot to tell them I had to have serious radio because I can't stand to sit and change channels all day long. You ever notice when you're traveling, you're always going away from the radio station, never towards it? <laughs> it never gets stronger. It always gets weaker. Oh, I like that song. And then it's gone. It's like tuning in. You're tuned in to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give you another example. Think of your best friend. Think of your friends, but then think of your very best friend. You're more in tune with that best friend. Why are you more in tune with your best friend than your other friends? Because you're closer. You're in fellowship with that person. I'm in fellowship with that woman like nobody else on the planet. I have children. I have grandchildren. I love them with all my heart. I'm very close to all of them. But I'm no, no more in tune with any of them than I am her. She is the one I'm most in tune to because Number one, we love each other. Number two, we have relationship. We have fellowship with relationship. So you can have relationships, but you don't always have fellowship with relationships. And so it's that same understanding that you should ha now have as a believer, as a baptized member of the body of Christ. You are functioning in the power and the presence and for the purpose of God. Amen. Chris is about 11 or 12. I, Malaya, how old are you now? Huh? Okay. No matter how young you are, you have the same power in you that's in me or that in Carmen or anybody else that's been Amen. saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. That same power is within you. Again, it's not for you to abuse. It's not for you to show off that's not what the Holy Ghost is about. The Holy Ghost always points to Jesus. He won't even take the forefront himself. He goes, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You're here. You're serving. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, guess what he's doing? He's serving the purpose of Jesus. He's serving Jesus' purpose through you. 
And you are tuned in to him now like you've never been before. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gifts are available to you. Not only are the gifts available to you, but the fruit of the Spirit should be the result of you drawing close to God. You should be able to, to be a little sweeter, be a little uh, full of a little more joy than someone who's not. Why? Because the fruit of the Spirit is alive and well in you. That's what the Holy Spirit produces in you. And I don't want to get into teaching on the fruits right now. That's coming down the road somewhere. We're going to really get into this Holy Ghost understanding. Amen. And I want this body to function. Which means to utilize that power while consistently being in His presence. Now, did you get that? Yes, amen. Yes, amen. To function in the Holy Ghost is to utilize his power consistently realizing and understanding his presence so that you can accomplish the purpose of God. Hallelujah. That's, what, that's what you were born for. Hallelujah. That's what you were born for. God, God has foreknowledge of who's going to serve him. And I don't want to get into predestination or any of that because that's a whole subject on its own. But he, he knew you were going to get saved. He knew you were going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, he did not fill you with the Holy Spirit for you to go back and be the same person you've always been. Right. I've never seen it fail that someone who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and really understood what they had done, that you did not see yet another change in that person. There's a spiritual maturity comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a spiritual maturity, a spiritual seriousness, a, a, a spiritual desire of that believer to want more. And I've been telling you for almost a year that we need to draw closer and closer and closer. Amen. I got something I'm going to share with you next week that the Lord showed me the other day. just really excited me. How many of you are still praying about your, your regions? Okay? Continue to pray. Don't stop praying. Don't worry about, well, there wasn't hardly anybody here today because, you know, we've been praying and we're not, we're not growing. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. Quit, quit worrying about all that. God's got it all under control. He knows what he's doing. And his promises are still his promises. So you continue to pray. You continue to pray over those reasons. Don't back off that. Don't, don't say, well, I haven't seen a, a direct result. You don't know what's going on in that in that region. I'm going to get a little off subject here, but it's very important. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit so you can be more serious about your prayer life. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit so you can be more serious about your service. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit so you can be, uh, have a better understanding of who God is, what He wants to do in your heart and life. Amen. That's a big step y'all took the other day. Amen. That's a huge step. We got adults in this church that for whatever reason don't feel the importance of getting baptized or they don't understand it enough to get baptized. I don't know their purpose. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody. We've got adults that haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit and some of you kids have. Uh -huh. Doesn't make you a better person than them. Doesn't mean they're not saved. Right. But you, you took a step. You took a very important step in your walk with the Lord. Amen. You took a very important step in your walk with the Lord. But you have to learn to walk in that, get in step, you know. Inevitably, we always had somebody in the squadron when we were learning to march, we always had one guy mess up. You'd be surprised how many people can't, you know, I mean, they teach this in high school band, how to walk in step. They don't get out there and just all, you, you'll notice all the legs are going the same. Well, that's the way the military is. Except that one guy, you know, he just can't quite get it. And, of course, the thing about being in boot camp is everybody gets in trouble. Right. Not just him. Oh, you got somebody out there that's out of step. But you're not out of step anymore. You're in rank. You're locked arms with other believers. People that you don't even know. People that maybe you haven't even met yet. God's going to bring them across your path. You allow that power, knowing that you have the presence of God with you. Wherever you're at, he's with you. You don't, have no, you, know, you don't have nothing to fear of anybody. You don't have to fear anything. Daniel sat in the lion's den. That's not a myth. I know you've heard that story. 
You know, a lion's natural nature is to eat you. You know, they are not afraid of humans. They're not afraid of humans at all. So their natural instinct is to reach out and gobble you up. So you're at a place where you don't have to fear that. You don't have to fear what the world can do to you. Why? Because you have this all-powerful power that dwells within you. The presence of God is with you. It's right there with you no matter where you go. Now that's true whether you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit or not. But the, the point being you, after having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are now more receptive to that. You understand that more. You, you feel that more. You have a, 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 a nature that, that, just like that lion's nature to eat you, you have a nature that functions in that now. Your nature is to believe in the supernatural. And I'm going to get into that next week. I want to talk about supernatural power. That power you have is a supernatural power. And so you have that power showing you his, and the assurance of his presence showing you what it is that you need to do. You're in that perplexing place. You don't know whether to go left or right. Call on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will not lie to you. You have to, you have, you're, you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you can hear what he's saying to you. You can better discern what he's saying to you. He'll speak the same to someone. Let me say this and, and, and get this, kid. He'll speak to that person who hasn't been baptized, okay? Right. He'll speak to that person who has been baptized. What is the difference? The person who has been baptized is going to be sure that they're hearing the voice of God than the one who hasn't. That's because you understand how the Holy Spirit functions. You have that power in you. You have that understanding of his presence. If Jesus himself was walking with you and you're on a precarious trail, you say, Jesus, which is the most safe trail, the left one or the right? Do you think Jesus would lie to you? No. You know he wouldn't. He would tell you to go to the right, go to the left, whatever the case. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're going to realize that. You're going to, you're going to feel His presence directing your purpose. You're going to feel it like you've never felt it before. That person who hasn't been baptized will feel the same thing, but they're not going to respond to it because they don't understand as much about the Spirit as a person who has been baptized. Now, this sounds like you're making second-class citizens out of those who haven't been baptized. I'm not doing that. I'm trying to get everybody to understand that we have this power within us. It's just like the gifts. A person who has not been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet has the gifts, the ability to have the gifts. Again, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's, how many of you read that after I told you to read it the other day? Two people. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells you about the gifts. There's not one word in there that says you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to function in those gifts. So why don't people who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, why don't they function in those gifts? Because they don't understand them. They don't understand even when the Spirit of God is speaking to them, they don't understand. It's like me getting on that ladder. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost told me not to get on that ladder or not to get on that step. But I did not listen. Had I been depending upon the presence of the Holy Spirit, had I been depending upon the uh, Spirit of God to guide me and lead me, I would have realized, hey, that's God talking to you, not just your opinion. I was, I, I was not yielding myself at that moment to the Spirit of God. And so I made an error. Michael, y'all come on up. I'm on. I'm going to have to stop right here because if I go any further, I'm going to get into another point. It's going to take too long. Everything that the Holy Spirit does is purposeful, okay? Everything that the Holy Spirit does is purposeful. So you have to know what His purpose is 
in order to function in the manner that he wants you to function in, right? He may not explain his purpose, but if you know it's his purpose, if you know it's his plan, if you know it's his voice, then you're going to yield to that. You're going to, you're going to understand, this is God directing me to help this person. This is God directing me to not do this or to do that. You're going to function in that because you're listening to the Holy Spirit. You're going to function in that because the Holy Spirit is directing you and guiding you and showing you what to do on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. Get that, kids. That's the power you have in you. That's the understanding of the Holy Ghost. That's an understanding of walking in step. When we would march in boot camp and that one person would be out of step, that didn't mean he wasn't part of the squadron. He was still part of the squadron, but he was out of step. To walk in the Spirit, you'll never be out of step. You'll never be out of step with the body of Christ if you're obeying the Spirit of God. It's that simple. And so we have to know what the Spirit is saying to us. We have to understand His voice. We have to understand that small, still voice that tells us what to do and what not to do. Amen? Amen. Praise God.